Great. We'll let uh, Douglas move back to a seat. We'll open this up. Uh, I'm going to uh, impose the Roden rule and ask the first question, and then um, after I've asked it, if you get my attention, I'll add you to my list. So this is <laughs> this is for this is. We thought you said Roden. Um, <laughs> a rose by any other name. Um, so uh, this is for Dan. Um, I know that you're very early in the in the genome uh, business. Uh, uh, but uh, would it be called GAC then, I guess, would be the, uh, but um, the question is, is uh, have you thought about how you might apply some of the depletion approaches that you discussed to non-coding uh, regions of the genome since there's clearly some important information there that we need to be able to begin to think about how do we crack that? So firstly, I can reassure you, it won't be called GAC or GEEK or GEEK or any of those things. We're, the, the tentative name for it is NOMAD, G-N-O-M-A-D. So that's our, that's our plan at this stage. So for the whole genome version, um, we're obviously extremely interested in looking at constraint in non-coding regions, but it's worth being realistic about the challenges here. In, in coding sequence space, we have a couple of key advantages. We, we already know the chunks that are important in these regions. And secondly, and I think most importantly, we can divide up variation within those regions into different functional classes very easily. We know synonymous and, and protein truncating, for instance. In, in, coding, in non coding regions, both of those go away, and we're, we're left actually with some real challenges in defining these regions. I, I think there's a good chance that we will be able to define a small fraction of the non coding region as, as being under constraint using these approaches. Um, but the regions will generally have to be quite large and, and very constrained for us to be able to pick them up using, using this approach. And I, I, don't, I think it's going to take massive sample sizes before we can really start zooming in on, on um, for instance, particular ver types of variants within particular enhancer regions where we can really say this, this variant looks like it's likely to be pathogenic. Ted, do you have a, uh, an estimate of what you think the sample size would be, uh, would be needed uh, to do that? So, so it continues to get better as you, as you get bigger. But here I think we're easily talking in the high hundreds of thousands to, to low millions of samples to get to really get very tight resolution in, in some of these regions. I mean, just bear in mind, even for protein coding genes, we're, we, we'll still be getting gains as we start approaching a million samples, which, which would have sounded stupid if I'd said it five years ago, but now, you know, a million samples is actually not terribly far off. We will, we will reach that, and I think the, the resolution then for non-coding regions will require us going even larger. Yeah, that's another good action item to come out of the meeting would be a million samples funded by NHGRI to, to do just that. So <laughs> thank you. I'm very supportive. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so other questions uh, for this session? This is, uh, be, if you got a million samples, Dan, would you have to put them all through that recalling pipeline again? Uh, ideally. So the, the challenge here is if you, the, 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 there's various ways in which this can be done. The, uh, the, anything that deviates away from the goal of having a, a fully harmonized variant call set will result in at least some level of batch effects and uh, issues across the data set. And depending on how, how, how much that's confounded with things like population, that can cause all kinds of chaos downstream. There, there are ways of making this a little bit easier. So the, the, I didn't go into the details here, but the variant calling process works in two stages. The first is a very computationally expensive stage where we do single sample variant discovery. So we basically say for each of those samples which sites are potentially variable and that, that results in an intermediate file which is quite compact. It's possible to do that it's so long as we, and we're actually working on this within the common disease uh, centres, the, NH, the NHGRI funded ones, standardising at least some of the early parts of that process so that it's possible to then share processed versions of the data with at least one central location that can then do the final step of joint calling across all of those samples. Ultimately, although I at least I think right now, we still really do need to do some kind of centralized joint calling. That's, that's my bias, at least. So Daniel, I have a question around, uh, so how many genomes do you, whole genomes do you need before you can start having value to the data? I get that we're going to need millions and millions to really figure out what every variant does, but how many do you need to start having information that's informative today? So right now we have five and a half thousand and that's super useful. So if, I mean for the, for, it depends on which, which part of the analyses that I discussed today we're talking about, of course. For, for frequency filtering with, with 5,000 genomes, that means you can say, here is a non-coding variant that is above 0.1% frequency, and we can, we can throw that away for some dominant disease, for instance. So that's, by itself, that's, that's definitely useful. It's, um, and I, I want to be very clear in, in talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of genomes, that's really focused on that question of how do we zoom in on constrained regions of the non-coding genome, and that just does require much bigger sample sizes. 
there's a continuous spectrum of information that goes from even, you know, th thousand genomes was not a waste of money. That was an in enormously informative project. But then as we get bigger and bigger, we'll be able to do more and more things with that data. Just a technical question, Daniel. Um, for the genomes, are you going to go back in and look at the algorithms for the variant calling since they were developed for exome sequences? They may not be perfect for the genomes. Of course, that means you'd have to do all the exomes the genome way and all the genomes the exome way, or both the perfect way, which all of which options are a bit complex, but still may be useful. It's a good. I'm not. I guess I hadn't really. I don't necessarily think that we're going to see much of a difference between the genomes and the exomes in, in terms of variant calling. There's, there's one way in which the variant calling will clearly be much better with the genomes, and that is because we have PCR-free whole genomes, which are glorious for things like indel calling, for instance. Um, we're not currently using PCR-free approaches for exome sequencing, so that's not quite as nice. Um, that will probably require some, you know, recalibration of, of the model, but that will be done within, within VQSR, within the, the standard, you know, model development approach. I don't think we're going to need to do anything fancy, but I could be proven wrong, in which case that's going to be a pretty horrible thing to try to fix. Yeah. Looking for you to do that work to see whether you need to be proven wrong or not since you have the data and you're out of the road. So, so let me um, ask another question since I'm not seeing any other hands here. Um, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, cricket. Okay. Just, just a short comment. Um, yep, so, go ahead. Um, so we've done some um, exome negative genomes. Um, it's a small n. It's only 50. There's another 300 coming next week. But um, we've seen about a 15 percent pickup of missed SNVs um, from exomes. And, and a lot of that reflects, you know, the date of when the exome was done, part one. Um, and the depth of coverage is perhaps the most impressive thing because it's obviously far less uniform. Um, and so it, it, it really, you know, what we're going to see in broader numbers, I don't know, but we were pretty impressed with 15 percent. Yeah, I think there's, um, there's, a, there's an ongoing conversation about the relative merits of exomes and genomes, yeah. and that, that was a, actually a big topic of discussion at the, the uh, and how it is laughing. Uh, that was a big topic of discussion at the, um, the center meeting last week, both for the Mendelian centers and for the common disease centers. Uh, I think there, there was some consensus among the Mendelian centers that we're, we're probably seeing, comparing a really good recent exome to a, to a genome, the yield, the increased yield is maybe closer to 5 to 10 percent, but it will depend, as you said, on how good the initial exome was. Um, most of that will come from structural variants. Um, many of those, we, we've certainly got some cases in our hands that there are structural variants that are balanced and are completely invisible to exome sequencing. There's just no way we could ever pick them up, and we do see them with genome. Uh, but, but that 15 percent was not any structural variants. That was SNVs, single oh, nucleotide variants, which is pretty impressive to me. That, so that's definitely very different from what, what we've seen, but I guess, again, it'll depend on the relative, I mean, the, what the coverage was of the original exomes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that um, reflects to some degree what um, the Nijmegen group has reported, although they would admit that a lot of theirs were, were on pretty poor exomes, and so their yield is much higher. In our experience, where we've done um, probably now 50, uh, exomes and genomes, um, we have not as yet come up with anywhere we've identified confidently a variant in a genome that we hadn't already seen in, in the exome, but we anticipate we will see some. I want to come back to your um, wish list, um, because that actually was a question I had asked before you answered it. Um, from your perspective, um, what could a group like this contribute in terms of the things that you are specifically looking for to enhance your resource? What would be the, uh, the role that we could play either in terms of generation of uh, data, contribution of data, the, the safe harbor uh, issues that you mentioned in terms of tying phenotype? What, what, would, be, what would that look like? So um, th there's, obviously, there's, there's lots of different answers to that question. One, one is about um, the the generation of the sheer volume of, of data. So big sample sizes matter enormously here. Um, these, these, to some extent, will come around through the natural process of the, of the common disease centres. Um, I was reassured, actually, to hear that out of some of the discussions from the common disease centres, there, there has been a move away from a wholesale focus on whole genome sequencing towards exome sequencing, although I think there's definitely value to both. There will be uh, substantially more value, I think, at this stage to having much larger numbers of exomes than there, necessar than there would be to have a smaller number of genomes. So that, that's, a, that's a great outcome. For, from the, so simple, simple data generation is a, is a big win. 
The, the second thing that I think is critical, and this has really been a challenge for us, is a whole series of issues around on the regulatory front where it would be fantastic to get guidance and clarity about how we can actually proceed with uh, things like, you mentioned Safe Harbour, but for instance, the use of European samples and how that's going to change moving forward as, as European regulations start to shift. We have a lot of European samples that we need to, to figure out what to do with. Um, what, what ethics are actually required for us to be able to um, to aggregate samples together and share that aggregate data, and is you know are we are we okay to keep doing this in the way that we're doing, or what what else do we need to do to make that easier? Um, and then and then finally, how how do we actually do this really difficult thing of being able to link variant data with phenotype data? Everyone who uses Exac completely understandably wants to ask the question of that variant that I've seen in my disease patient that you have five people in Exac that carry it. What phenotype do those people have? And at the moment, we have almost no way of answering that question. We can sometimes do it in a very ad hoc way. What we'd love to do would be to have some database that allowed us to actually push out systematically for suitably consented samples, uh, phenotype data that was linked to, to those variants, but in a way that didn't de-identify the samples and was not considered to be violating any of, the, any of the ethical issues around that. And right now, we have absolutely no idea how to do that. And I think some guidance from this group would be fantastic to, to help enable that. Uh, let's do less first, before, and then Dan. Yeah, um, so we've had some experience with this, um, having consented all of our sequenced individuals for post hoc phenotyping out of the gate. We have a little bit of an advantage there, so I think it's going to be a tough sell and probably highly heterogeneous in the responses you're going to get from IRBs and other uh, agencies regarding that question. Um, so. Good luck with that. Thanks, um, thanks. But it's actually worse uh, because I think for a lot of these variants, the phenotype data that you're going to want may not even yet exist. So you, what you're going to want to do is to do a post hoc customized phenotyping and actually bring this individual in, uh, these people in, and do phenotyping based on the genotype. Uh, and that is asking more. Uh, and it will be. Probably, uh, mostly, you would assume it will be unrelated to the reason why they were sequenced in the first place. And people, as I have learned, get very nervous about anything that's unrelated to the primary indication. Uh, so there's your whole challenge there. But it, it can be done with the right cohorts. And actually, the main problem we have is that people are complaining that we don't ask them to do enough things. Mm -hmm. So it can be done in the right patients with the right consent. Right. D is there a way to add another? I mean, I, I mentioned at the break, you, I wanted a column that said, you know, what phenotypes have been associated. And I understand the difficulties. But is there a way to add his data or other kinds of predicted functional data to that to that set? Is that do you, do you envision that? or? Do you think this is a sort of standalone, and then you sort of take your variant and then go off to Doug or somebody else and, and figure out what the predicted function is? Is there one giant place we should be aggregating these things? So, so I was actually really pleased to have both of us in the same session, because I think the two data types are really complementary and provide enormous amounts of, both, both of them provide lots of information that, that really meshes together quite nicely. I mean, my, my vision for how this would work in a, in, a, in a situation where you have a patient who turns up with a VUS is that you can immediately, you need to be able to look up three things very rapidly. The first thing is, um, has this ever been seen before in a, in a collection of reference individuals like Exac? If so, how common is it? D is, there, is it associated with some phenotype there? That's, that's piece one. Piece two is, has it, seen, has it been seen before in disease patients, disease patients like mine? And that's, that's where pro programs like Matchmaker Exchange come into play and, and those types of issues. And then, and then if it's a completely novel variant, as Doug mentioned, Many of the variants we see in our, in our disease patients, in fact, most of them still right now, are completely novel. They've never been seen in, in, a, in another patient or in Exac. You then need to be able to go immediately to these large high throughput functional assays and say, does it, does it have some functional impact in this, in this pre-prepared, amazing pre-prepared table of, of variant impacts that Doug's generated for every gene in the genome? And I think having, having the ability to have all three of those types of information laid out in, in a way that is accessible to people who are actually doing clinical interpretation is, is, is where the future has to be in 10 years' time. The question is, how do, we, how do we make the steps to get to those three resources all put together? Yeah, I think that that raises a really interesting question about uh, uh, the user face, user uh, interoperability, the role of ClinGen, uh, things of that nature. Um, and at some point, um, 
and we've touched on this uh, on several occasions uh, during the discussions today uh, about you know the perspective of the end user and at some point um, you know we'll need to think about how do we engage with those end users with all the great things that we have and say it's not just about what information um, we have that we could give you, but what information is going to be the most useful to you and how can we represent it in a way that at least we can raise the odds that um, it's going to be used in a proper way. And I think, you know, we default sometimes to the idea, well, it'll be clinical decision support, um, which um, I think if we think about that writ large is probably true, uh, but the, the details of, in terms of how you would deliver that and when you would deliver it and, and how you would get the data uh, to you know, operate in such a way uh, that you could uh, make it work at the point of care just in time uh, is a daunting informatics um, uh, exercise, uh, one that we could potentially build on some of the work that was done at, uh, at GM7 on genomic clinical decision support and the, the ClinGen work. Uh, but ultimately, I think we do need to think about this from a, 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 you know, a, a beginning to end type of a scenario uh, and without that end user feedback, it's going to be very challenging. We, we will likely design something that will once again not be utilized very well. Yes, uh, Carol. It strikes me also if we had a system that allowed you to, to seamlessly get at those three areas that you just outlined, it also would help better align basic research efforts with driving clinical need because it would it would give you all those variants where we're just blanked right now, right? And where we need sort of the basic model organism work to jump in to try to functionalize them to move them into something that clinical relevance can be more obvious. So that whole, we're, again, we're talking about data again, which I think is good for me. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I think that this vision um, is, is what is kind of what we need to get that alignment of the basic and the clinically relevant work. Yeah, so I think as we, um, I, I, that's a good point. And we think about, you know, the pushing the information out to the clinicians, but clearly we, we, it needs to be bidirectional. Um, so thinking about how we could then lower the bar to contributing the information uh, that is needed. Um, you know, by our basic science. I mean, that's really the intent of this entire meeting is to try and sort that thing out. But as was pointed out, it's at the present time, even if there was a button for me to push in the EHR uh, that would allow me to send that data into some sort of a useful repository, uh, it would have to be routed through 55 lawyers and HIPAA specialists and compliance folks. And so figuring out how to do that. Now, whether PMI, you know, under its rubric is going to, um, you know, create some policy solutions to move this information is, uh, I think, unclear at this point. Uh, but it seems obvious to me that this is a, another group that will need to be engaged because there they're talking about sample sizes of the size that we're dealing with, along with at least some set of phenotypic information that will be collected, although that we don't know what it looks like yet. Howard. So I wondered if you'd, either of you have looked into your, your data sets around allelic balance, and I specifically say balance, not imbalance, because we, we've, that, that's one thing that's, that's currently missing. With the kind of data you have, we could start getting that level of, of information. We're, we're, it's a bit parochial, but right now with, uh, in the cancer space, we're doing a lot of clinical sequencing. It's almost all uh, both locally and as a send out tumor sequencing with no uh, normal, um, for, mainly for cost reasons, it's twice the cost, uh, almost twice the cost. And, and so we have a situation where these, there's these variants of unknown significance, uh, these variants of, of almost known significance, um, they're in a domain or whatever, so we call those VACs. Um, but then there's also these uh, variants that are likely pathogenic in a gene there. We hit it against ClinVar and it might tell us something. But uh, knowing that there's a, a variant that um, was seen in your database, but it was only 3%, not 50%, uh, would be really helpful as we try to interpret whether one of your patients had some residual cancer floating around and you picked it up, or whether there's something else. And again, that's a very nuanced question, and I'm sorry for that, but it, I think there's a type of data that we're not really looking at that could be quite informative as we're trying to apply this stuff. 
so yes, indirectly. So there's, there's information actually within the, um, within the, the VCF that you can download. You can actually have a look at the average allele balance across the individuals within the data set. You can also actually, for most of the variants in XAC, you can there's raw read data available. So if, if there's only one to five individuals present with that particular data, you can actually see the reads yourself in the browser and, and use that to decide you know, whether, whether the allele balance is correct. I think it's a fair point. And as I, I, super, I very superficially touched on this, but we have actually identified a number of previously reported severe dominant mutations that are in XAC individuals, but clearly are somatic mosaics because the allele balance is way off. There may be only 10% you know, allele balance. So I would say that the type of data that I talked about isn't going to speak to that because we're starting, you know, we're sort of starting with a library that we define that's, you know, a coding sequence. Although, you know, we and others are thinking about assays for splicing and other things that could be, you know, useful in that context. Um, I did want to just comment on on a thread that that was going easy uh, earlier, which is this idea of how to, how to talk to basic scientists. And I, I, I mean, in my own my own experience, right, is that it's been hugely helpful to hear from clinical people, like, where is the actual need? Because it's kind of hard to figure that out, right? So if there was some sort of index of clinical need over all genes, that would be <laughs> really nice. Um, you know, we, I, I, I got hooked up with the PGRN, right, has, which has been hugely helpful in clarifying my thinking about how to apply the kinds of methods that we you know, that, we, that we've developed. Like I, I told you about SARC. Well, we started there because I thought a few years ago, SARC is cool and there are inhibitors in the pipeline and let's see if we can build a resistance map for SARC, which is what that project's all about. But it turns out, you know, um, it, it turns out that when we talk to clinicians about that, they're like, no, no, you should do something else. So, I mean, I don't know, that's a, it's a Chinese wall problem, I guess, but. Um. Well, there are, I mean, that you could imagine ways to, um, uh, to tackle that in the sense of we, we do maps all the time for disease impact, whether it's based on cost or days in the hospital or whatever, and then within that subset you could say, well, what are the known genes that could impact things like renal disease or cardiac disease or that sort of thing? And so if you did that type of an association with genes, you could at least have one measure of prioritization where you could say, well, the, if we solve something in this realm, the impact across the healthcare system could be enormous as opposed to you know, this little piece over here, although that little piece over there may be much easier to actually um, uh, do it. So I'm, I've got Howard to, on this, this strand, and yeah, I, I know, but uh, are you guys, well, now we got 20 people, okay. Good, we finally hit the topic. So, so Cecilia and Stephen, let me ask you, because you were first in the queue, are you speaking to the same issue? Okay, so, so I've got you on my list. Let me just hold on to you for just a second. I've got Howard, I've got Les, I've got Deborah on this string. Not on this string. Deborah will go in the other queue. Okay, this is the complicated. So Howard, please. So, um, so I think one of the discussions around this that, that maybe to frame this slightly differently is that, uh, and I had mentioned this to Terry, is that I think the variant of uncertain significance is not a problem if you know what the gene does, right? And so you mentioned this and you're trying to model this, right? So for example, cystic fibrosis, once you know that that gene plays a role in the disease process, having a variant inside that, you can actually model what that would be, right? So one of the challenges is what we call a goose, a gene of uncertain significance. So the problem is you have a variant that looks like it doesn't work, has a problem in the gene, but you have no idea where it goes. And so back to the basic biology side, you were saying, you know, is there a way that you could index? Yeah, all the genes that we have no idea what function is, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm not being flippant. I mean, there's a huge number of genes, and we really should be thinking about how to prioritize that. Now, COMP and some of these other projects are working on that, but I'm not sure how far we've taken that to a level that we can now start saying, what do we know about the, all of these genes that are unclear? Because I think that would help so much in knowing where we want to prioritize and think about some of those things. Yeah, just a quick follow-up to what you said, Mark. I think one of the things that uh, ClinGen is doing that is potentially relevant, as you and I are both aware, is actionability. And so questions related to being able to know what to do with a variant is at least some degree tied to how medically actionable it is if you want to know how much clinical traction there is to your data point. And so I think that's a starting point. And as well, I th it makes me think that potentially ClinGen uh, ought to consider for actionability 
the uh, concept here of you know how much do we understand about mapping a variant to a function of the gene in order to be able to do something to a patient. I like that title. <laughs> <clears throat> Let it be so. Perfect. Uh, and I was just going to follow up. So yes, definitely think that's worthwhile for the actionability group to consider. We should take that back to them. And then as far as assembling sort of this list of what we know about gooses, I mentioned earlier sort of our work in curating the clinical validity. So at least starting there to trying to really understand what evidence exists to um, authoritatively say that this gene is linked to a disease. At least that sets the stage then for doing the, the variant analysis. But that is also a place where we really could use some work. So we took, the, not we, the, the ClinGen group that's doing that started, um, as far as integrating the functional data, the, the paper that came out in 2014. So that's sort of our starting place for how we're um, evaluating evidence in the literature. But I think we really could use input from sort of the, the basic scientists on if we're doing that correctly, uh, what other evidence should be incorporated into that matrix to make sure we're not missing something big that's not going to be useful back to the community. Great. And Dan, I saw your hand. Is this related to that string as well? This string as well? I, I, I wanted to ask Doug a question, but we, that can come later. It's not okay, I'll, I'll add you to the queue. So Cecilia, um, uh, you have... Yeah, I, um, I have a comment and question maybe combination. Um, the exact database is clearly enormously useful, but one thing that's frustrating for me is the fact that the data is aggregated. So if you're interested in more complex genetic model and you want to test certain hypotheses, there's just no way to do that. And I understand the reason why, you know, it has to be this way, but I'm just wondering, is there any other alternative? Can there be an honest broker? Um, or just go to Dan and, and get his help to analyze some of the data to ask these more complicated questions. But to me, enormous amount of genetic information is lost when we aggregate that data. And if we're moving towards trying to understand more complex genetic model of disease, we need that information. And so I, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I have an answer, but I'm just thinking that this is something that we need to somehow face and figure out a workable solution so that all of us who will eventually go down the path of looking at more complex model of disease that we have some way to actually um, get more useful information out of that huge amount of um, data. Consent. Yeah, yeah consent is, is the problem. So just to, just to highlight the, the challenge here. So we, we can release data aggregated by variants because there's no way of re-identifying re someone's exome from, from that process. As soon as we start releasing data that allows you to say there is an individual who carries these two particular variants and then index that across the whole exome, it becomes possible to reconstruct someone's entire genetic sequence or at least a big chunk of it. So, so that means that publicly releasing that type of data isn't possible. The, on, the honest broker model, I, I think, is the right one. At, the problem at the moment is that uh, EXAC, and this, this won't actually change, is composed of cohorts with a very complicated set of consent and data use permissions, where at the moment the only entity that actually has permission to store all of the uh, individual level data is, is the bro. There's no, there's no way to actually transfer that to any other party. So we, we can uh, certainly help, help with analyses wherever possible and, and on that we're bandwidth and, and resource limited. Um, but I think as, uh, as other cohorts come together, PMI and other, and other cohorts where perhaps there is you know, thought put in up front to address these, these kinds of issues and it's not done in that opportunistic way, then I think there, there could be opportunities to be able to ask these uh, questions that rely on individual level data. Great. Um, Cricket, then Stephen. I had a quick question about the use of trios, either at the exome or the geon, genome, because um, there have been a lot of um, RFAs about those, and it would be a shame to lose that information. Um, and I realize that also raises, again, the level of confidentiality. Um, and my question to Doug, but maybe I should wait. Are we going back to Doug <laughs> later on? I'll throw a question to Doug as well, which is that when you think about the proteins that you describe for us in the functional assays, I was very struck that all of them are loss of function. And yet, that's not really true in biology. We see some variants have gain of functions, and I was wondering how you think about that. Well, so we can, we can see gain of function in some assays, right? So we found, we found about 1,000 gain of function variants across the, sorry, across the, um, 
seven proteins that I showed. They're rare, and again, a function variants are rare compared to loss, but um, we, we try to set up our assays to detect both. Um, the kinds of general assays that, that I was talking about at the very end, those are probably only going to be sensitive to loss of function. You know, to, to, to measure gain of function, you really have to have an assay specific for the function of the protein. Um, but, but we and others have, have done those on the scale of tens, and I think even just if the rate doesn't change, we'll have hundreds of such data sets in, in, in a few years. Um, but yeah, you can see them, and they're there, and they're interesting. Like, like I mentioned in SARC, we can see the canonical SARC gain of function mutations, and they do exactly what they should do. They activate kinase function. Yeah. So I have Stephen, Deborah, and Dan, and that will probably bring us to time. Um, so uh, Stephen. Yes, so I think uh, I would agree with other people who have spoken of the value of the EXAC effort uh, as something that um, is quite remarkable. Um, I also have questions like Cecilia. Uh, my particular one is more recomputing the variant call files since no single aligner um, is going to do, um, you know, there's, there's value in having several aligners uh, and variant callers. Um, and so the direct question would be whether that's possible, um, since that would, I think, add a lot of value. Um, as you think about a future version of EXAC, and you spoke about 120,000 individuals, I certainly hope that there'll be a focus on uh, minority groups, uh, since that's really clinically where we're stuck, you know, with Caucasians. I think we do have really good allele frequencies, and uh, so we can, we can be highly predictive when it gets to Hispanics, African Americans, uh, Asian subgroups, uh, we really often, we just, our, our, our allele frequency information is pretty much hopeless. And then lastly, just in thinking about what's next, in, uh, I'd be really interested in other people's opinions on this. Uh, you know, something I'm struggling with myself. Is the next gold standard going to be a complete genomics exome or genome or complete genomics genome? Uh, these are very interesting questions since none of us yet have structural variant information uh, of any type of quality that's going to be clinic clinically meaningful yet. And so that's a whole piece of our, our uh, diagnostic universe that really we're missing these days. By, uh, by complete genomics, you actually mean the, the BGI version? Or? I, I'm sorry, I always get those mixed up. 10x genomics, oh, 10X, chromium. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yes. okay, good. Yeah, I can. I can. Um, so, so there's three three questions there. The first one was about um, testing different alignment and calling methods. Um, we we definitely think that there there is clearly some orthogonal value to different aligners and callers. The challenge is that the computing requirements for EXAC to do that even once were pretty monstrous. And to be honest, I just don't think I have it in me to do it again with another aligner and another caller. So I think for the, for the foreseeable future, our goal is to do the best possible job we can with the alignment and variant calling pipeline that we have and just allow that that's going to miss some, that people who use different pipelines will have, will have different, uh, different data, data types. And um, I guess with, with additional resources, it might be possible to go back and do that. But really, I mean, this would be an unbelievably expensive exercise to do that with, particularly going back to the alignment stage, to do that on 200,000 exomes or 20,000 genomes. It's, it's a, it's, that's a lot of, a lot of cost. Um, what if it was free? Uh, then it would still be incredibly painful, but, uh, but doable, <laughs> but doable. So, so yeah, I think in, in, the, in the magical world in which compute was free, then that would, that would be pretty cool, yeah. Um, the second question was about other populations. I didn't touch on this at all. Uh, again, in, in EXACT v2, we remain c completely opportunistic in terms of uh, looking for the data that's available. No, just to emphasize again, EXACT doesn't do any of its own sequencing. We rely on other, other people to sequence populations and then be willing to share the data with us. There's big holes in our, in our data set right now, and I, um, th those are elided over in the continental level breakdown that I show. But we're missing, for instance, the Middle East at the moment is a complete, um, complete black hole in terms of reference populations. We have basically zero in Middle Eastern samples in EXAC. And yet, of course, the Middle Eastern samples are overrepresented in our rare disease cases for, due to consanguinity. That's, a, that's an enormous problem that, that at the moment I'm not sure that we have a clear path to solving in the sense that I don't know of any other large scale common disease sequencing studies currently underway in Middle Eastern populations that are likely to have data shareable with us. If, if those do come about, we, we'd be delighted to, to work on, in, on including those samples. We're, of course, missing big chunks of Africa and many other populations around the world. 
again, to the extent that um, NHGRI's focus continues to be on in increasing minority representation, which I think it sensibly is, these data will come along in time, but it'll, it'll, we're dependent on, uh, on other people doing those, doing those experiments. The final question was about 10x genomics. I, th I think other people should comment as well. I only have my own experience to go, to go from here. We've uh, looked at 10x uh, exomes as well as genomes. For those of you who don't know, 10x allows us to look at linked read data. So it basically allows us to look at long, long haplotypes um, within the data, both for exomes and genomes. Um, I'm very excited about it. I think it, it adds power, not only in terms of haplotypic phase, but also uh, we, can, we can look at, it's much more sensitive to copy number variation, incredibly so. And this is true even for exomes. So I think there's a lot, a lot more experimentation to do. We have a, a pilot project that we've got underway at the moment. Um, once, once that comes out, I think we, we can see how that looks, but, but at the moment, I think it really does add a lot of value. Great, Deborah. So I just have a residual comment that it, it is very difficult clinically to know where the truth is in the accuracy of variant calls. And that's something that I think we all struggle who do this testing. I don't know which system is right for doing the calling. But, but my question is, it seems we're paying attention to a single variant at a time. And the reality is that patients, all of us, have multiple variants either in the same gene or in multiple genes. And there's pathways that are affected that cumulatively result in diseases. And how do we begin to approach that reality, which is moving away from more the single gene medical genetics approach to genomics to the reality of what each of our genomes is doing to create the phenotypes that we have, either medically relevant or, or otherwise. Is there any way to even begin to approach that? I have, I have two answers, one, one of which is that um, in my world at least that will require enormously large sample sizes. So as soon as we start relaxing our, our genetic models to go from monogenic to diagenic or more complicated models, that means that our power drops precipitously and it becomes incredibly important to, to build up sample sizes. My second answer is to point at Doug and say that he has to try and figure out how to solve this because I think the most, likely ex the most likely approach here will be through some kind of functional system where it's possible to introduce pairs of mutations that are, that are candidates within a particular patient and then see if they have some non-additive effect in a, in a model system. Could, could I just ask whether or not there's another approach to this other than power? Because each one of our genomes is fairly unique. And so will you ever get the power to say that this combination of mutations is resulting in this disease because you see it enough times? Uh, or is there some other approach that we have to start taking? Not that I'm aware of. I think apart from the experimental approach, it's uh, diagenic and more complicated models are gonna be extraordinarily difficult to solve statistically, you know, using statistical genetics and require massive sample sizes. So that's why I think the functional approaches will be more important. Um, and, and I think maybe there's, there's some hope there. I mean, we, we've started, so we, we've developed some methods for installing variants at, at multiple loci in an efficient enough way to actually screen, you know, screen large libraries. Um, so that's coming down the pike in our lab, and then there's been some really beautiful work using at least genome-wide gene knockouts in human cells to sort of build a two-by-two two map of, of knockouts, right? And so, I mean, I think, you know, the progress will be made, but it's, it's sort of a reflection of the same problem. You know, it's just going to take development and more, you know, every time you add a degree of interaction, you're increasing geometrically the number of interactions. So a question that, that I have that I'm, I, I don't know that we have the answer to yet is, exactly what degree is going to be important, right? I mean, do we, do, is measuring all, you know, all pairwise interactions enough, or do we really need, as you suggest, to sort of be able to make and test each individual genome, you know, <laughs> separately? Like, that's, that, that's a tall order. I don't know <laughs> if, uh, you know, I mean, I guess that sends you down the road of, for those phenotypes looking at iPS cells, you know, patient-derived iPS cells, individually if, if you know but that's a that's hard to it's hard to multiplex that kind of approach so you know we're looking at pairwise interactions at the moment that's as far as we've gotten but. so we've been gifted a bit more time so Dan I had a comment and then Gail um, so I actually had a question for Doug which is about I wanted to push a little bit harder on the generalizability question because the the, the key thing here is for that, for that three-pronged vision that I laid out where you, you know, a clinician can look up each of those three different things. 
the key thing is that for their gene of interest that they actually do have some high throughput functional assay available and it's already been generated where that particular variant has actually already been put through an assay. So you mentioned, so obviously the, the assays that you showed were dependent on select, selectability as a marker. You mentioned that you could use flow sortability as another, another approach. What, um, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense as to what fundamental limitations that places on the number of genes you can actually, number of genes and number of functions you can actually test using, using this system. And maybe even if, even if a very hand wavy number, what fraction of total known disease genes as of right now do you think could fundamentally be assayed using these types of approaches and which ones are really are totally out of reach? So those are, those are all good questions. Um, you know, I think, I think starting from the, the last question, you know, probably the capacity to implement the technology, the sort of technologies as they currently exist would be, you know, on the scale of, of maybe hundreds of, of, of genes that could be, you know, over the next few years. I mean, obviously in the limit of resources, they could all be done, but, um, you know, hopefully as we, you know, as we sort of get better and better, you know, thousands would be doable. Um, I think in terms of phenotypes, using the, the type of approach that I told you about with flow sorting, then I think, you know, you're probably limited to, we're thinking in the neighborhood of 10 phenotypes or so that we want to flow sort for. You know, we can test a bunch of them, pick the most maximally informative set of somewhere around 10, and then, you know, um, see what that gets us. Um, you know, there are other ideas that people have talked about um, that, you know, if they work out could, could you know, be better, um, but they're not, I mean, in terms of what's practicable now or in the immediate future, I guess that's what I'd say, maybe 10 phenotypes per variant in a general sense, and maybe a few hundred, you know, functional assays for the most critical genes. But I, I think an open question is how many do we have to scan before we get good enough at making predictions? Like, is it going to turn out to be the case that every protein is idiosyncratic, or if we, if we, once we have a, a really nice data set for a protein in a family, do we then have the power to make fairly accurate predictions for all the family members, right? And if you think about it that way, then the number that we need to, to examine drops you know, quite a bit, so. Terry. Great, so before uh, Mark calls on, on Gail, let me just ask my panel to uh, converge up there, so that would be Les, Greg, Kat, Aaron, Liz, and me, if you would just head up that way, thanks. Great. And just to respond to uh, Doug's uh, comment, certainly some of the work that uh, we did at University of Utah um, suggested that um, uh, you could do pretty reasonable calling within families uh, after you uh, have a pretty, pretty well phenotyped um, uh, set. Uh, of genes within there, even working off of one or two well phenotype genes. So I think that is likely to reduce some work. Gail, last word for this. I have a question, and maybe Carol can help with this. So I know in the mouse community, people spend eight to ten years developing this outbred cross and trying to put more defined diversity into the mouse to look at complex traits or modifiers. And so I wonder for some of these issues, you're not going to get necessarily the specific variant. It's not always going to be perfect. But again, if you've got secondary variants and you're trying to sort out which gene may be playing a role, that for some of these models to go back and use that cross um, to help with some of these questions. Yeah, it goes back to this issue of being able to perturb the system sort of genetically and then look at the phenotypes that that come out of that. And so as a way of getting at principles of these things and modifiers that might be related to, to human disease, that certainly is the intent and there is work going on to do that now that leverages a lot of the genome editing technologies that are coming on board so that we can make specific variants and then put them in the context of neighborhoods of other sorts of variants and see what the phenotype outcomes are. So that information, again, I can see feeding in to the type of resources that people are talking about here, being able to address specifically in an experimental context. Great. Well, I've su su sufficiently perturbed the group here. So uh, thank you for the good discussion in this group, and we'll turn it over to Terry and the panel.
Great, thank you very much. Um, I know it's late in the day. We thought a panel would be something a little bit different um, to, to kind of stimulate folks a, a bit. Uh, and we had, had actually identified a few questions in case there wasn't enough topics for discussion. Um, but we probably don't need to, to use those. We can kind of draw from what, what's happened today. Um, one thing I would like to take advantage of that we haven't taken advantage of quite yet is that we have a number of NIH people around the room, um, both from our, our basic science division who've been very quiet throughout the day, um, and also from some of the other institutes, and, and would like to encourage them to, to speak up. Um, I am horribly myopic and undercorrected, which should be really scary when I get behind the wheel, um, but uh, it may also be scary here, so, so please wave if I'm, if I'm missing you. Um, but one comment that was made early, earlier um, was that we need some uniformly ascertained cases, at least a large number of them, for a wide variety of diseases. I think, Callum, you made that, that point, um, which seems to me to sound a lot like NIH Institute, you know, disease-specific studies. And I wonder if those around the room, either at NIH or Callum or others, can, can mention some um, that would be studies that perhaps have done really exquisite phenotyping but don't have the, the genomic sequencing that might be useful to, for us to reach out to. Um. So, so these congenital heart disease um, uh, groups, Cricket left the room, unfortunately. Um, but there's a congenital heart disease uh, consortium, as I understand it. There's an ARDS consortium. I'm thinking of all the heart, lung, and blood ones that I knew from my previous life. Um, but thought. So I think there are, there are many uh, cohorts, but I, majority of them have been phenotyped in a limited number of axes. Certainly, that's the case, for example, for the the congenital heart disease cohort. I know uh, Cricket, in retrospect, was, was mentioning some of it. There are very few of them have been systematically phenotyped, for example, in a neurodevelopmental axis at the same time. Uh, so those are the types of things that I think would, you know, prospectively be very straightforward. As I said earlier, I think the scale of what's required suggests that you might need to do that outside a, a disease-centered cohort. And even when you're thinking about some of the work that Daniel talked about where you're trying to work out what the, you know, the marginal risk for a particular allele is. If you've collected, if you've ascertained your entire cohort on the basis of the disease that you're interested in predicting risk for, you're already in a sort of vicious cycle of, uh, of prior probabilities that probably doesn't bode well for how you would look at it in the general population, which is ultimately what the individual practitioner is going to require. Quick question on that, Callum. What percentage of those patients do you think are consented for a recontact to come back in and do? Because it seems like a that seems like a great one to start with. If they're already got a good cardiovascular workup, then the the other workup would be. Great. I honestly don't know. I think it's very. I mean, I will say that you know, Les's cohort. We did an atrial fibrillation cohort that did the same um, the same consent uh, type strategies, but a very small number of those partly because the IRBs were quite resistant to that type of clause when, when these studies were being designed. So I think that's, that's actually one of the things that is an important uh, issue here, is that almost all the cohorts that were, are mature enough where they actually have now been collecting or being sequenced were cohorts that were consented under a very <coughs> different set of um, perspectives than are now relevant to understanding the genome. Greg, what about the IDD cohort? The Caesar cohort. Can you go back? Do you know were they excluded from having cardiovascular symptoms? Yeah, there's no exclusion. Um, it's relatively small numbers that were, you know, talking about hundreds to low thousands. Um, and uh, we had permission for recontact, but we'd probably need a separate IRB for sort of unrestricted medical record trolling. Yeah. Suppose you could bring this to be recontacted as a phenotype in its own. <laughs> Although, you know, a separate IRB is, is a barrier, but it's not an insurmountable one. And, and if, if there's enough value, I mean, I think one could expect that most institutes would have supported primarily their disease phenotype and perhaps not related phenotypes, although in many cases they do, you know, expand beyond theirs. And, and certainly, you know, some diseases and, you know, you look at inflammation and it's, and it's systemic and, and that. So, um, so there may be possibilities there. I don't know, Mark, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I think also the recognition that um, there are a lot of cohorts that are now being created under new uh, consent with full 
uh, consent for use of uh, sequence data, medical records, and recontact uh, that could be uh, done. I mean, we have 100,000 uh, patients that are under con uh, consent with recontact, um, all of whom are going to have exome sequences. And so within that, there could be, you know, uh, disease-specific cohorts that could be done under uh, some type of a uh, arrangement either with an institute or center, or you could say, well, maybe it would be of more value to do extremely deep and comprehensive phenotyping uh, on folks that don't have any sort of pre-existing uh, condition, but I think that you know we're we're not the only example of of that type of a cohort that could be leveraged to do this type of work. Uh, no, I think I'll pass on that. Great. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cecilia. Yeah, I just want to mention in terms of congenital heart disease cohorts. Um, uh, obviously, PCGC has a very large collection, and they are moving ahead with sequencing. But I think the, the as I think it was already mentioned the phenotyping data, maybe not as deep. But I think that there are um, clinical centers at, at various different places where there are smaller collections of patients where there's deep phenotype data. Um, we, I mean, I, so where I am, we we actually have around 600 or so patients that uh, we, and also patients in Western Pennsylvania don't move. So we have a lot of longitudinal data. A lot of these are patients that were operated. So we also have outcome data. Um, so I think that there are um, clinical centers um, at various places where that exists. And we, we actually have DNA and cell lines on everybody. Um, so I think that it's just a matter of finding where these places are and finding opportunities. And so we're trying to compete for the Kids First um, funding to see if we can get some of them sequenced. Um, for, for trios, and they've all been consented for recontact. Um, so I think that if there are opportunities announced, I, I think that there are, I, I mean, I know a couple other um, places where there are a collection of congenital disease patients where, um, you know, it would be possible, where there's deep phenotype data and you can really move forward in a different way. And we also have brain imaging data on our patients. About 150 of them have brain MRI and neurocognitive assessments. So, so I think that it just needs to be a, context, a context to really get these things flushed out um, and move forward. So in, in terms of the deep phenotyping, um, obviously one of the use cases, if you sequence people who are well phenotyped, you have more power to determine whether that individual is part of your case group or part of your control group. Um, so I think those data sets are very useful. But one of the problems is going to be once you do the deep phenotyping and the sequencing, it's back to what Daniel said. Make, how do you make that? What's the path to make that data available to everybody who might want to use it? Um, and I think that's something that we all know has to be worked out, um, but it's not easy. So as, as a big thing to tackle, that might be the most important thing that would increase our ability to make more diagnosis. And, and I think that also goes back to the problem if you have to aggregate the data, you really just lose so much information. So in the end, not only making it available, but if you have to aggregate it, it's, it's a big loss in terms of the actual genetic information you're after. Yeah, and I mean, I mean available all the variants and uh, detailed <coughs> phenotype for each of those individuals and the ability to go back and ask them questions. No more. Well, I might ask Adam or, or others around the room, you know, we have our common disease um, uh, centers that are doing, you know, sequencing of, of reasonably well phenotype people, I believe, um, with a variety of diseases. Adam, is that a group that could be used for this that might be recontactable for uh, additional phenotyping? Yeah, I, I would have spoken up before, but I was trying to think about how much detail I remembered and the devils in the detail. I'm sure there are many samples that are going to be like that, but without without having the list in front of me, it's hard, hard for me to tell how useful it's going to be. So that, that might be a place to look where we could at least get started, you know, that's already underway and, and already already working. How, how good the phenotypes are there, you know, is I think a, a, of some question. You could, if you could kill your microphone. Can I, yeah. How do I turn this on? It's on? So then a follow-up question. No. It's not on. So a uh, follow-up question is, assuming that you get the, you know, you're able to get that data in one place, and you want to be able to use the individual level data, not necessarily aggregate it, but then, you know, we've heard throughout the day that 
<clears throat> the data is captured in, you know, using a thousand different protocols, you know, is it necessary to layer on some kind of ontology to that data to make it useful, or can we rely on sort of NLP and other avenues for processing the data? So I'm not, not sure if that's a question for me, but um, I, I think having having looked at phenotype data as put together by multiple different cohorts, it's um, at least in our hands, we found it extremely difficult to do any kind of phenotype comparison across groups without at least some attempt to do harmonization, obviously, of the quantitative traits and, and then structure, structured ontologies for the, for the ones that are more, more qualitative. Definitely in, in rare disease research, um, we, we've now moved to human phenotype ontology for, for all of our cases, and I think that um, that's made it, it it's, it's limited and it's not perfect, and it definitely doesn't capture all the scope of things that a clinician would want to put into a record but it does help us do comparisons between cases in a way that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So I have a question about um, the idea about consent and what you're consenting for. So, you know, we focused a lot around deep phenotyping, variant analysis, diagnosis. Um, but a lot of times we get past that point, right? And now we get to the point where we have a diagnosis and then we're incredibly, um, data deprived, so to speak. We don't have the deep phenotyping on the patients. If we were to make model organisms, it becomes very difficult to figure out which variant we would want to model. And then, of course, if you're going into therapeutics, um, biomarker analysis, what's happening at the level of the transcriptome. You know, if you're talking to a protein person, they don't care about the DNA. They're, you know, they're looking at post-translational modifications. And so, you know, from a model organism standpoint and then moving towards therapeutics, you know, having the mutation and the diagnosis is great, but then we have this incredible void um, of all of the rest of the information. So the long-winded question is, is there some level of a comprehensive, um, you know, consent form that you could get where you have access to not only, um, you know, recontacting the patient, but the level of the transcriptome, um, tissue banks, repositories, all of those things that go, so that you're dealing with one comprehensive consent, or is that, am I being naive, is that too much to ask? Like an NHGRI sanction. So, so. That's not a new thing. I mean, there's yeah. plenty of models for that. The, uh, most of our institutions have that sort of thing. The reality is it's not that often we get a piece of flesh from someone, even at a cancer center. You know, our, our patients love for us to take tissue from them because they don't want their cancer. Um, but yet we still don't have that many pieces to put in the bank. So I think the challenge is not the consent part. We, we have comprehensive longitudinal follow-up consent in our total cancer care study at Moffitt, for example. But the, the problem is how do we get people to want to actually be phenotyped that often and that deeply? So Cricket and then Mark. So, um, you know, I would agree that biobanks um, in a lot of academic institutions are doing this. Um, at the partners, there are 10,000 people who are consented to have anything you want from them that comes out naturally <laughs> or in, in the context of disease. Um, but remember that that is the joy and beauty and potential of iPS cells, that you could. And I, I limited my comments to say where we're not there today. But we will have organoids that could be patient specific. And while that's not going to be mass scale phenotyping, it certainly is going to allow for really rich phenotypes um, to be evolving, and especially in particular, you know, candidate disease genes. So. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I think this is uh, an area where we could, um, you know, do some um, searching uh, for phenotypes of this uh, type. In our obesity institute, um, all of our patients that undergo uh, bariatric surgery, in addition to having, um, uh, if they're consented into our uh, project, in addition to having exome sequencing, we get um, a liver and adipose tissue at the time of surgery. So we have um, those tissues uh, across now uh, probably at over a thousand patients where that would be available. And so, and I, again, I'm sure there are other collections uh, like that that could potentially be uh, sought to say, can we use um, these for other purposes? And with, uh, under our consent, that would be possible. Great. Uh, yes, Mike. I was just going to say that uh, the PMI consent, uh, as far as I know, has not been drawn up yet, but it would be a good opportunity for 
people from this group to weigh in on the kind of things you would want in that as it's designed? Yeah, I think that's that's being worked on now um, and might be something worth worth keeping in mind. I can't imagine that it won't be as broad as they can possibly make it, um, but there are constraints on that, as you can imagine. I was more speaking from the reference point maybe of the ALS community where we had all of these tissue banks and repositories, and at the time, you know, then we get to the point where we want to sequence and those patients haven't, had never consented um, for that. Mm -hmm. And that becomes relatively frustrating. And the answer ALS also has, um, you know, these IPS cells. And, and while I agree that that's a great, you know, every patient will have their own IPS cell and then have that, you know, do that phenotyping, um, but it's still, you know, a cell, <laughs> you know, it's in, in, it's in, in a dish, and it doesn't necessarily give us the insight to the databases, and I'm thinking now about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, where they're starting to follow patient populations, you know, even large populations, even if they don't know that they're going to develop Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, you know, to see if they can be more predictive, and so it seems like that global approach is, is, is pretty ideal, um, but I don't necessarily see a lot of people focusing on it pre-symptomatically, you know, it seems to be once a disease diagnosis is made. Um, but I might not, you know, have all that information. Well, again, I think that's where, you know, healthcare centers are collecting every patient. I mean, Geisinger is doing that, as best I know. Um, you know, Vanderbilt is doing it. A lot of places are doing it. Every patient, irrespective of disease. And for patients who begin in childhood at an institution, that's lifelong. Great. Okay, maybe um, we can shift to the question of quantifying evidence. It's something that, uh, that I think we've all struggled with for quite some time. We heard a couple of suggestions of things that could be quantified, one being the, uh, let's call it the inferential distance of a, of a phenotype from, uh, from the actual clinical characterization, uh, another being uh, what, what Daniel showed us in terms of, of comparing the frequency and controls to saying how impenetrant would a, a variant have to be to be a, a causal variant. Um, what do you folks think, and I'll, I'll ask this group first, um, in, in terms of other ways that we could quantify evidence and, and the needs for that in order to try to put it into some kind of an algorithm that then we can assess. So, Greg, you want to? Yeah, so I think this is a case where um, Daniel and, and Doug's talk really, um, for me at least, are the, are the path forward is thinking very big. It's empirical null models, right? You do lots and lots of people, you do lots and lots of variants spread across lots and lots of genes, and it's very easy then to ask how this variant, variant X, had this, you know, some functional effect, some unit of measurement, and you ask questions like, how rare is that? Well, I've tested a million mutations, or 10 million mutations, or eight and a half billion mutation events, and this is where it ranks, this is the standard deviation, this, you know, you get a very empirical sense for what is the probability of that observation. Uh, and that is the sort of thing that lends itself to building these probabilistic interpretations of, of genotype, phenotype correlates. Now, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I, I know it's and like I said, I really like Doug's talk, is, is thinking very big on the functional side, especially, uh, you know, I think when the ENCODE pilot phase, for example, was, was sort of conceived and started, the whole genome was very daunting, right? So it was, let's do 1%, where we're doing arrays, doing other things. We don't know what assays are going to scale. We don't know what information they're going to give us, but it's worth trying 1%. You know, there really, there are 8.5 billion SMVs of the reference genome, which is a, a big but very finite number. You could envision, envision a lot of assays that actually are meaningfully scalable, you know, things like do I up or, regulate, up, up or down regulate transcription, do I affect protein structure, things like that where I would, you know, be very happy to have a generic pre-generated, even if it's not specific to my gene or my locus or uh, the mechanism that I care about, something that's generally available and, and, and quantifiable can turn out to be very powerful. And I think, like I said, Doug's data showed that. And, uh, and it also, you'll find new things, too, when you look at not just the variants, the 10 variants that you care about as good candidates, you're looking at millions of things you're going to find new collections of variants, new annotations that predict feature X. So even if your assay is going after one property, you'll probably be able to learn clusters of things that predict other properties as well. So I, I guess I would just say thinking big on that is the important thing, and getting lots of variants uh, is, would be a, a major priority. Les, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. yeah, I was struck by the same thing that you were, Greg, and um, it came across a couple of talks, both the cardiac disease uh, functional talks that we heard, um, and then Daniel's and Doug's talks. But the one I want to go back to is actually Stephen's talk. It looks like he had to leave uh, to drive home the point of 
Number one, um, and we tend to do this a lot as a field, which is um, a lot of self-flagellation. And it's important to go back and remember that even though we don't have all the variants and we don't have all the pathogenicity assessments and we don't, we don't, we don't, it actually works pretty well already, uh, which is great to keep in mind. And what that means to me is that uh, genomics has taught us that a lot of good data is better than a little bit of perfect data. And as a field, we need to keep moving in that direction, and that means we need to understand underlying principles of how things work, which is, I think, how the key thing that I often feel like I need to understand from my basic science colleagues. And then if we can transform that into high throughput functional assay so that we can get a reasonable estimate of how well the protein is working with and without this variant, then we can use those data, imperfect as they are and um, crude as they are, to sensibly uh, modify, again, in that sort of Bayesian inferential network, what the pathogenicity of the variants are. And I think there are some good efforts in this area. You mentioned the BRCA, so you have your DSB assay. The MSI assay uh, folks, I think, are making huge progress where we're going to have a huge catalog of decent estimates of how much each variant affects MSI, and then we can use that. And I think that that is the path forward. So I think we want to start to build a model where we have the basic science labs tell us what the principles are, connect something in the laboratory to the phenotype and then design that high throughput assay so that we understand the function of as many variants as we possibly can reasonably well, much as we do high throughput drug screens, and answer a lot of these questions efficiently, going back to Stephen's talk, because the decisions that need to be made, that he is making every day, cannot wait two to five years for the lab to work out everything and make the mouse and do everything you would like to do. We need the answer between one and five days, not between one and ten years. So, Howard, uh, Howard and then Liz. So, so, Les, I really, really like that. Um, but, and I think one of the things that we also do in this field is that we, um, we throw out a lot of things that, that sounds like what we're doing is inaccurate um, and that, you know, that we, we're not good enough yet to do a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in some senses by competing, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do the best science, but I think outside the field that's being confused uh, that this is not ready. This is not clinically ready. It's not useful. We can't do anything with it. So I think the question is, is how do we continue to drive forward improving it, making it better, um, but not shooting ourselves in the foot every time we turn around by this, this it's not perfect, and it's not going to be perfect for a long time, but it's usable today. So, so how do we balance that? And, I and I'm asking you now as, uh, on your physician hat, um, because when I talk to physicians, they point to it's inaccurate, we don't know how to deal with it, there's all this spurious stuff, the data is, you know, and, and so, but you just said we really need to be using this now, which I agree, but, but how do we balance that with the community? Uh, it's, um, there's a thing called the Nirvana fallacy. <laughs> what you said must have been important because we're hearing it again. Um, the Nirvana fallacy, which is comparing something that is actual with an idealized objective of what could be. And I think that's what our field is doing. And when people uh, yell and scream that, you know, you don't know the penetrance of all these variants in people when you ascertain them this way, that is true. We don't know, but we have estimates of what those uh, what the penetrance will be. And to break the nirvana fallacy, what you have to do is force people to say, okay, what's the clinical reality? And someone said this earlier, I can't remember who. What's the clinical reality of the decision that you're going to make in the absence of this information? And what's the reality of the decision you'll make with it? And again, 
in Bayesian reasoning, every piece of incremental data that is valid, even if it's not perfect, improves your decision. And so we, that's the way we have to start thinking about this. And unfortunately, I think we and our colleagues are often more tied to tradition, that's the way we've always done it, than we are to logically reasoning through this and using the good data that we do have. So I think that's what we have to pop, is that, that nirvana fallacy balloon. So I have Liz, uh, Liz Howard, Mark, uh, Callum, and Gail. So I think to, ec to echo that, I mean, we're really lucky. We live in a time where there's really good ways to analyze and store disparate large data sets that are sometimes poorly structured. And so the key is, what's the use case? What's the question you're trying to ask? Let's go and gather these questions. And then people on the informatics side, we can work out how to store the data um, and map the data, but if we're doing that without having a good set of requirements, a good set of use cases, then we're going to run into trouble. I just want to play off what the, the better Howard was saying a couple minutes ago. Um, that we, We've learned a lot. I think Stephen's talk was a, was a, a great one for highlighting the, uh, you know, the best is the enemy of good type of thing we get stuck into. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And, and you know, we, we, we have one eye. It's not a great eye, but it, it does see something. And, and we need to be moving forward. And, but we need to be better prepared to learn from our actions. And we don't have this iteration that goes beyond what happens in an individual institution or even sometimes individual lab, if we're, if we're that inward. Um, and so that part. And then we, we haven't really applied it to, the, to our basic, or more basic science colleagues, which is part of the point of this meeting for these two days. But that sort of interaction is, is, um, is rare. Um, in, in, our, in my inst the institution where I am now, the, the clinical buildings and the research buildings are separated by one of the, the three valet parking areas. It's called Gold Valet. And we jokingly refer to Gold Valet as the Grand Canyon because, the, you know, the only time the scientists go across it or go to the cafeteria. Um, and, you know, no science comes across the, the Gold Valet. It's, it's, it's just for eating purposes, you know, for walk there. We, we need to be interacting in better ways. And part of it has been we've started including our basic folks, some of them, in some of our clinical tumor boards because they can help us get from a variant of unknown significance towards a clinical action. And they're, they're terrified that, that we're going to mistake them for a doctor, uh, that kind of doctor. Uh, but, they're, but they're willing to help us know what happens in a cell. And that's really valuable when you have to make a decision, like you pointed to, for a patient and you have nothing else to go on. And so I, I think there's opportunity here to really put forward. And if we're going to make genomic medicine great again, um, we need to um, <laughs> we, 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 we need to really be pulling this together and moving forward. And that's I think that's our opportunity. Yeah, yeah I'm sure Howard is a so, very nice guy, uh, but uh, so, so Les, uh, sorry, Les is going to preempt you for just a second. No, it was no. it was totally off color. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so. I would posit that um, ever since Lejeune published um, the Down syndrome chromosomes, this has been the dilemma that genetics has lived in, Mendelian genetics. We've, every new technology that's been introduced has led to this dilemma of, you know, how good is it? How many, how, what resolution of bands is, is resolution enough? What resolution of microarray is resolution enough? How do we interpret this? What what does this inversion mean? Oh, it really doesn't mean anything. Well, we maybe shouldn't have counseled people about, you know, about this. But um, the difference that I see it is that we've been able to, um, up until relatively recently, do this as sort of a craft. In other words, it's just our little group uh, of craftsmen that can talk back and forth and can kind of make these decisions and use literature and traditional methods uh, to be able to learn incrementally and apply that knowledge incrementally and then subsequently build on more. We're not talking about moving something from this craft into scale. Uh, in which case we're talking about much larger data sets, many more people involved, a vastly um, uh, larger phenotypic landscape. And so we have to think about innovative ways to uh, be doing this. It's not that the 
job is different, but the scale of the job is tremendously different. And so that's where innovation around how do we create the methods of sharing data back and forth to rapidly and incrementally improve our knowledge is important. And frankly, it's, it's healthy for us, you know, to be talking about, you know, things like, well, we're calling the same variant different things in different laboratories. That's exactly the sort of thing, you know, that we need to be uh, doing in order to improve uh, what we're trying to do. Um, yes, there's the risk that that could be interpreted as saying, well, you guys don't understand anything, but we have to come back and say, well, actually, here's all the ones that are in there that we all agree on. This is what they are. We're trying to move these into that space and then find more and keep doing it. So um, uh, that's, it's a, it, that part is a messaging uh, issue that uh, the fact that we're publishing this type of information is so that we ourselves can commit ourselves to continuing to improve, not to say we're terrible, we don't know anything. I'm going to interrupt the sequence because I think Aaron has a comment directly to this and then we'll go on. It's really just to echo what Mark said. For example, <clears throat> Clean Bar is becoming a really valuable resource where there's, Melissa might even comment how many variants are in Clean Bar at this point, uh, roughly. I think it's 140 some thousand. Yeah, 140 some thousand, but you hear a lot um, in the, the press and from the public that, well, there's so many conflicting reports in ClinVar, but we, you're right, we do need to make that message to the community, but we, that's where we have to start. At least now we know six labs have analyzed this variant for this disease, and three of them said it's pathogenic, and three said it's a VUS. So that's a, an important point, Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, so Callum and then Gail. I was, I was really just going to echo what Les and all the hards had said, uh, which, <laughs> but, but to point out that I think we, we and I said it earlier today, we tend, to, we tend to fixate on the diagnostic point, and until we're sure the diagnosis is perfect, we're never moving forward into a, a, an intervention arena. And I think if, if this were another biomarker, I mean, we would all already be in, in clinical practice routinely. It's, if you imagine the things that people are using and what the <laughs> pretest probability and the post hoc reinterpretation are like, and you compare it to what we're trying to do in genomics, we're, we're already way ahead of many assays that are in very common clinical use at the moment because they were built into a therapeutic trial and as a result are part of the, the co-development of that therapy as it moves forward through clinical care. Respond to that. I promise I'll get to you, Gail. <laughs> yeah, just to, yeah, just to amplify that a bit. I think it's uh, another component of exceptionalism which is killing us, which is the legacy of determinism and I think all that talk about determinism led people to think that the standard is that our predictions and our correlations would be 1.0. And it's, of course, ridiculous. None of us think that way. We all think probabilistically. And when you compare our predictions to other predictions in medicine, they, many of them compare very favorably or superior to them, and yet, it's like, oh my God, no, you can't use this because it's not perfect. It's really a crazy situation and we just have to stop that. So we've been talking about, I guess, ambiguity between the lab and the clinician and there's another level and that's between the clinician and the family and the patient. And I think um, some families are gonna take the ambiguity and roll with it and others won't be able to deal with it, don't understand it, won't be able to get beyond it. And so I think knowing the patient, the family, if you're not interacting with them as the clinician, working with the clinician who does, to try to, from before the test is ordered till you get it back and then you may get updates and all, to really work with the family, whether it's the physician, the counselor, or someone, um, to help them through this and to understand where they are. Because there's some families that maybe are not ready for unless it's really clear, and others that will take the information and go with it. And I think um, that's always going to be part of the interaction as well. So um, I, I'd encourage all of you to um, go back to your home state. You can probably do this online right now. And look up the policy for your largest insurer 
and what their policy is on exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. So if you haven't done this, you should do that. And you will be shocked at the papers that we are publishing and how those are being used to prove why we should not be doing genomic testing and paying for this. And so if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that because it's, it's pretty, I was pretty shocked as I started looking into this of what we're having as dialogue in this room is actually being used as ammunition for why we shouldn't be paying for this. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be publishing this because that's not what I'm saying, but we have to understand that, that some of the discussions that we have are being used against us. And it's just worth looking at that. And I think as a community, we need to start addressing those with our local insurances. And keep in mind that there's 50 states and there's multiple insurance companies and they each have their own policy. And it's a big, big deal that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, Howard, I uh, follow the metabolism listserv. I don't know how many people follow that here. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I just about broke out laughing the other day, reading a case, asking for help with their patient, and they listed, and it was a single space list, probably half to two thirds of a page of tests that had been done that were very, some very expensive tests, some quite invasive tests that pose significant medical risk to the patients in the performance of the test, test after test after test, asking what other individual low throughput specific tests could be done because the insurer will not pay for sequencing. It, that's just insane. Bruce, you want to speak to that? In, in this discussion about um, what level of evidence do you need to interpret something clinically, I think we have to remember that a lot depends on the clinical situation, which I guess really informs the prior probability. I would say that when you have a phenotypically affected person in front of you, you don't know what the cause of that is, and now you found a variant and you can make a compelling case, that that's a different situation than an incidental finding in a person who at the moment is perceived as healthy, or different, say, than a prenatal diagnosis in a fetus where you have at the moment, no other evidence of pathogenicity. So it's not a single palette here in terms of what the clinical application would be, and therefore not a single kind of um, approach to defining evidence. Excellent point. Um, I'd, I'd like to shift gears a bit, but actually pick up on a point that's been made uh, earlier today and, and that Mark made as, as well, and that's the issue of scale. And I, and I might ask my colleagues who deal in scale, um, particularly in the genome sciences division, Jeff and, and uh, Mike and, and uh, Elise and Adam perhaps, um, to, to think about, you know, when, when you get down to a patient, there's no scale, there's an individual. Um, and yet we need databases that are at scale to be able to interpret those variants. So, so what kind kinds of data resources, you know, are, are feasible for us to generate, let alone what might be needed by this field to, to be able to make those inferences. So Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think this is a really good example of, uh, uh, of where the <laughs> clinicians need to be working together with the basic scientists to define what really are the most useful data sets. We in the genome sciences think that the ENCODE data set is really useful. It seems very useful for biology. Uh, we have some indications that it's useful for giving people ideas of where to go uh, if you want to conduct a functional test. That doesn't mean you can use the ENCODE data set to uh, interpret a, a VUS directly, but maybe w combining things like what we heard from uh, 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 high throughput uh, protein perturbations and, and code, and, and depending on where you are in the genome, and comp and so forth, we can have enough hints to be able to, well, there are a couple ways to look at this. To first of all, not require the highest throughput functional testing in zebrafish or mouse or something like that, but to be able to zero in some of the tests. But then again, we need to know what are those high throughput, not perfect data sets uh, that will best inform that. Um, uh, uh, Cricket did mention it uh, in the, this latest discussion, though not in her talk, uh, that while there are certainly shortcomings to uh, 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 trying to test variants in iPS cells because they're just cells, they're just cells in a dish, as mentioned again up here. Uh, Cricket mentioned there are organoids on the way, and these are going to be mixtures of different cell types in a 
microfluidic system of some sort that will that is hoping to mimic a tissue and then you could presumably put the, test that tissue under different physiological conditions so these are all tools that we're trying to build uh, to to try to sort of knock down one at a time some of these barriers to being able to do the specific tests that we'd like to be able to do not sure that they're going to get us to uh, a, a three to five day uh, 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 answer when you have an actual uh, a, a patient in front of you, but there are tool sets that uh, hopefully, when in com combination, may enable us to to work toward answers to some of these questions. I uh, just mentioned that you know, for example, the the new round of encode is not only developing a. a uh, uh, um, amplifying, <coughs> excuse me, amplifying the catalog of, uh, of uh, potential uh, regulatory signals, but is working also toward, number one, doing that in tissue from patients with diseases, so it's not just K652 cells, uh, and, but also uh, has another component that's trying to actually zero in on which, uh, on, a, on developing methods to figure out which are the actual promoters and, and enhancers in a particular tissue. So, you know, we're, we are trying to move in these directions with some of the programs. But again, this is with somewhat limited contact with clinicians who are trying to figure this out in patients. We do need to meet better in the middle. Great. So we had, Greg was gonna make a comment and then Gail? Yeah, I was gonna say one follow-up to that. So I, obviously I, I'm a, a big fan of ENCODE and the data that comes out of it. But one thing that is a major sort of conceptual philosophical difference is what the, the VUS community wants is variant level data, right? And that ENCODE has been, you know, arguably quite reasonably said we want lots of TFs, lots of DNA, you know, we want lots of, uh, a small number of cell lines and tissue types with lots and lots of assays, whereas a variant focus would be we want a limited number of assays on a whole bunch of variants, right? That gives me something where I find a variant and somebody's already tested it, which is very different than trying to figure out, well, it overlaps with this, that, and the other thing. So I would say that, it's arguably a different sort of philosophical thing. It connects with ENCODE in some ways, but it's arguably also a separate issue, which is ENCODE has defined all of these basic element types and where they exist, and now the, you know, one major goal should be let's saturate all those elements with mutation events and register what they do, which is, again, a different general goal. And, and let me just mention that there, we have a, a, a technology development program that's trying to scale up those kinds of assays. You know, this is kind of along the regulatory. So this is in my clinician hand. I've had two patients referred to me um, for genetic counseling related to diagnoses. One was um, a VUS for an exonic splice enhancer predicted by two programs that it didn't change the amino acid and the patient was told they have the disease, go get the genetic counseling. And then the other are intronic variants, I think this one was 9 in or 16 in, um, the intron with no functional data anywhere. And so I think this is the other side where um, some labs maybe, or I think, are totally overcalling or confusing clinicians. And I think we have to be very careful with these kind of regulatory things. And you put it in a report, and even though it says, clinical correlation and variant of unknown significance. It's in a clinical report and programs predicted it. And so that's why I think clinicians or the clinical hat hasn't bought into um, all of the enhancers and the, the ESCs and all of that because I think that we really need functional data um, that this is relevant clinically. Deborah and then Mike Pazin. So this is going to seem really radical, I think, to this group, and it's going to go beyond crickets free-for-all. I, I have watched a number of people who have high school or college educations interact with their genome information, and they explore it, they look at it, they correlate what they're seeing with what they're experiencing in response to taking certain drugs or, or taking vitamin D and having awful reactions to it. And of course, they have that vitamin D thing that affects their metabolism of vitamin D. I, I go back to my comment, there's a patient in the bed. We're not just at the bedside. I really think there is valuable information that curious, motivated individuals, now this isn't 
every individual, but there are a lot of people who can provide a lot of information in response to their genome information if given access to it and allowed to explore it with maybe some support, someone they can go to to ask questions or to get feedback. I know that is not a medical genetics model um, classically, but I think we are missing a great opportunity by not involving patients. Individuals, people, healthy people. Excellent, excellent point. So we have um, Mike Pazin and, sorry, did I get you, Gail? Did I skip you? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, Mike Pazin, Bob, and then uh, Wendy. I just first wanted to respond to something that uh, Greg said and, and then something to something that uh, Jeff Schloss said. Um, with respect to the ENCODE biosample portfolio, a lot of people misunderstand what's out there. We have, for a small number of cells, a very large number of assays. But then for a very large number of cell types, a small number of assays that include hundreds of organs, primary cell types, tissues. A lot of people seem to think there are just six cell lines. And there are plenty of people in the community that are taking advantage of this in, in their um, basic science and also in their translational studies. <clears throat> so for example, pretty recently, Jay Chandray published a paper where they were hypothesized that perhaps in cell-free DNA you could get from people's blood that that might, that the DNA breaks might come from the cell type of origin, compared it to ENCODE chromatin accessibility data and found out that there's some reason to think you might be able to tell who has cancer from this and what cell type of cancer they have, even without other symptomology. That's a really powerful idea that could be followed up and couldn't be done without that basic science. But following up on what, what Jeff said and also what Howard Jacobs said started us off with, I mean, we can't, basic scientists can't push the information out to clinicians if the idea is that no one will believe a fly study or a mouse study, then no number of fly or mouse studies will ever convince that person. Or if the study has to be done in an ambulatory person, not in an organoid or a cell line, then no number of those studies will ever convince people. So we do need to hear from clinical practice what kind of information would be credible. Thank you. Excellent point. I'm not sure we know, Mike. That's the problem. Uh, Bob? Yeah. I, Gail's description of her case reminded me of my thinking this morning when Howard was asking, his case presentation is asking at what level, at what point would you put this in the medical record? And I think, I think as I analyzed when, why I raised my hand when I did, it had to do with the fact that I've, I've done biology. I understand enough of the biology um, and the physiology behind this. And, and in fact, it was the EM of the podocytes that, um, that did it in, in part because I had seen a patient before with a, with a rare genetic disorder that affected the podocytes that had severe kidney disease. So I had some context that actually came out of a, of a fairly rare, um, rare knowledge base, I think, and, and that allowed me to make that jump. And I think that's the difficulty that most providers in practice have is that they don't have that comfort level with that kind of information. So that's one of the challenges I think we need to, to address. Wendy. So I think I'll uh, jump off of your comment, and I, I actually pushed this button to respond to your comment, which is I, I think that we're, we're a bit stuck because we, uh, the laboratories are there interpreting the variants largely, and um, you know they don't really have the detailed clinical data. Um, the patients have them, so I'm, you know, uh, classically trained and all that, and I have the you know issues with uh, the direct to consumer and so forth. But I, I think that's an incredibly valuable um, way to engage people. But I wonder if we've kind of given up on the hard work maybe it takes to um, extract data out of our complex medical system. Um, because it's so hard, and uh, I have um, a much better uh, belief in functional assays than I did yesterday, listening to a lot of this uh, today, and I'm much more hopeful. Um, but I do recall, uh, you know, I have my biases as well. Um, in this case, it was a negative one, where uh, in the ClinSeq data set, there was a uh, uh, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer CDH1 variant, um, and the functional assay predicted uh, it would be deleterious. So I'm reading all the 
evidence like I would with my clinical hat on back in Chicago, and uh, I was pretty convinced. And then it turned out, because of the frequency data, you know, it really is not pathogenic. Um, and so this fear of being misled. Um, but I, I think I'm, I'm making the point, yes, we, we need multiple ways in, but it sounds like we may have forgotten <laughs> that, uh, let's say if we're talking about uh, conflicts in ClinVar, um, and they are a serious proportion and, you know, they have to be dealt with and we don't have to beat ourselves up too much. But um, we could, for known phenotypes, we could actually go pretty far to resolve those if we only collected more detailed phenotype information on patients that supposedly have a VUS, and, but they're affected, you know, and vice versa. So I, I'm seeing this as largely a way of how do we... Um, the, the reason this is a, a hard problem to solve, really, is because it's a systems issue in our healthcare delivery system. And um, to even start to get the partners together to really discuss that is really hard. <laughs> um, but the, the data problem itself is, is it's a tractable problem. You know, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, the phenotypes collected in a standardized way and the tools to put them into a place where you can see it all together and algorithms and so forth uh, to make sense of it. Um, and then you don't really have to extrapolate. It's not a, uh, a model. It's the patient, okay, or a set of patients who have disease, not disease, based on a, you know, a series of findings. Um, so I'd like to think there's sort of hope <laughs> that we could also go in that direction at the same time. Great. Well, and I, I might ask, you know, the, the issue that, that Monty raised early in the day about having the basic labs get access to the full patient data. I mean, I, I wonder if in some yeah. cases, Monty, it's not even the full patient data because there are questions that clinicians don't even know to ask, right. but, you know, based on what you might find. So, so Les has a wonderful story about hereditary pressure palsies that I'll maybe, maybe I'll let you say that, that never would have been picked up if, if the question hadn't been asked of a patient. So on. Um, yeah, it's pretty, I don't think it would surprise very many of you as a man who was in uh, ClinSeq uh, and had a, actually we had picked up three people with HNPP out of a thousand, which is actually stupendous. Um, and one of them was a man with uh, type 2 diabetes who had w well controlled early recent diagnosis of diabetes and came down with a diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy. No, he has HNPP. And, you know, the inference was all made, and he, in fact, he did have a reasonable probability of having diabetic neuropathy at a later stage and with poor control, but with the genomic information, it totally changed the calculation of the relative likelihood of diabetic neuropathy versus hereditary liability to nerve and pressure palsy. And though it wasn't, wasn't why he was sequenced, wasn't what we were looking for, it came up, it's not a red flag, it's a green flag. This is something that you need to know. Well, and, and something that the patient would not have volunteered unless you, unless you said, you know, you have this variant, but you don't have this condition. Oh, yes, I do. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, all right. So how, how does that translate to what uh, Gail and Wendy were saying in, in the clinical setting where the clinician orders the test, it goes to the lab director, and there's really little exchange of phenotypic information at all? That's really an important problem that we need to tackle. So I had another question along those same lines about patient reporting. Um, you know, sometimes when you work with these rare, di rare disease foundations and these groups, you know, they'll even say, well, I see my doctor once a year or twice a year. What do they really know about my condition? Um, and then there are... Um, foundations, and, and I don't even think, it, I think it's not even a foundation anymore, but patients like me, you know, who are self-reporting almost on a daily basis, you know, their, their phenotypes, and how much, I mean, this is a question, I don't really know the answer to it, but how much are we integrating with those groups to crowdsource that data from the patient population? I'm just, can I follow up on Aaron's point? And I think Aaron's point links back to what Bruce said a little while ago, which is that prior probability issue. And I think what great diagnosticians do, 
naturally is they have, number one, a huge repository of clinical information that they carry around in their brains. And then number two, they actually have the ability to do sort of uh, seat of the pants, Bayesian informal reasoning. And that I often tell people when, you know, the classic situation is you sequence somebody, they have a variant, then, oh, it's Noonan syndrome, and then some uh, uh, smart aleck comes along and says, tut, 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 you didn't need to sequence a patient. I could have told you you had Noonan syndrome. Um, and I, what I tell patients is, you know, if your physician is William Osler, you don't need to be sequenced. <laughs> But if your physician graduated, you know, in the, in the, if they're in the middle of their career, they graduated in the middle of their class from an average medical school, <laughs> you might need to be sequenced uh, because they're not as good as William Osler. And, you know, the data are useful. And the more data we have, the more useful it is. And if you think as Bruce was laying out and you understand the priors and you make conscious and deliberative determinations of which error you want to make. Do you want to make an overdiagnosis or do you want to make an underdiagnosis? And in different situations, the different errors are appropriate. And then when you set those thresholds right, these data are incredibly useful for making those determinations. First of all, can you imagine what Osler would have done if he had a sequence at his disposal? And actually, it's an interesting point because, in a way, what the sequence does is it sharpens your vision. Because I think we have to get out of the mode of we send the test, we get a report, we go back to the patient, and we're done. What actually ought to happen is a dialogue between the clinician and the laboratory because the lab may raise questions that you didn't think to ask when you saw the patient. You go back and then discover something that the laboratory actually stimulated to, to be found. So two comments. First, in terms of the patient disease groups and all, I mean, now when I diagnose someone, I tell them, very soon you're going to be much more of an expert on this than I am because, you're, you know, if they're motivated and they go to the groups and they go to the meetings and all, and it used to bother me a little. It doesn't bother me anymore because, you know, there's so many diseases and what you want to do is not miss the obvious thing in surveillance or something that's not related or things like that. So I think it's great there are patient disease groups out there and they can provide them things that I never could because I don't have the time. The other thing in terms of the, the disease, and I'll take the Noonan example. So I've been sending Noonan testing, and I've never had one come back. And then our lab finally started the, a big panel, 13 genes. And the first one I got was the newest, CBL, which has this high risk for uh, AMML. And I had a variant of unknown significance. And it was like, oh my god, I was better off before I <laughs> knew to order the test. You know? Um, and that's not true, but I think even where we know the phenotype, some of these newer genes are going to have different risks and all, so it is important to do it. It's nice to get it right the first time, you know, you pick the right panel or something, but I think there's so much more information now about all the different disease genes that um, it's definitely important, at least in my mind. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to call on, on a couple others, but I just wanted to uh, reassure you that even though we're going beyond the time for this panel discussion, Carol and I long ago decided we didn't have anything wise to say at the end of the day. Um, so we will finish at 6 o'clock, so don't worry about that. Go ahead. So I'd like to follow up uh, on Aaron's comment um, uh, about, you know, how do we get improvement with the physicians in the, in the dialogue. And, and Stephen Kingsmore actually said this in his presentation. I'm just echoing this, is that one of the challenges we have is that the clinical laboratories that are doing the sequencing, and, and I think we have a good one, we're, we're disparate, if you will, from the data that comes in. And so the idea of, of democratization and getting this out there is because it is dynamic data. Right? So I, I don't know of any, and maybe there's something else out there, but I don't know of any other test where you could do one wet lab test, and then that data now becomes useful for a long period of time. And I think the disconnect between the physician, the informaticians, the sequencing, and the follow-up, and the patients, I think, Aaron, is one of the big challenges that we have to face. And, and as long as everybody has to go get it someplace else, and there's a handful of clinical laboratories that are doing this, I think it restricts um, the value of this. And I think the physicians that are treating that patient and anybody who's been in a case 
uh, a case conference on this where the physicians are actually going through the data. It's a completely different experience uh, than you're in the case conference as a clinical laboratory and you have a paragraph that's you know six or seven sentences that are trying to describe the phenotype. And so I think the balance is how do we figure out how to do that? And the discussion for the day is there's not a lot of people trained on it. How do we get it out there? Um, but I think that that's really where the dynamic phase of this has to be is is having it at people's fingertips and it's not just, it's. It, you know, I don't know if there's any radiologists here, so I don't want to offend anybody, but it's not just another x-ray. I mean, so. I was thinking about that, too, having it at their fingertips and then laying on this discussion about ontologies, because <clears throat> if it's going to be data in all these disparate places, even if it's at their fingertips, you can't integrate it without any kind of ontology. But we also heard from Cecilia and others that that's really, I mean, a lot of people are using HPL, but that's not necessarily the end all be all, and there might be multiple ontologies that need to be mapped and linked together. So that's sort of an additional complexity. But if, if we could at least map s some standards onto these disparate resources, it'd be easier to integrate. Maybe not necessarily for the clinician up front, but. Well, and I, I might just interject before Colin um, talks about the, the radiology an analogy is not a bad one. If you think back 10, 15, 20 years ago, back in the olden days, we actually used to go down to radiology and review films with the radiologist. And we'd talk about the clinical correlation and they'd say, oh, you know, and they'd hold it up to the light and they'd do all kinds of other things and, and you know, suggest other studies and, and that sort of thing. That, that isn't happening with, with this test and, and really needs to. I agree. Is, is it? In, in Vermont, I bet it's happening. Well, in Vermont, and I know at UCLA, they have a, and many places where they're doing this sequencing, they do have these interdisciplinary conferences where the results are discussed, and you do go back to the patient, and you get more information. So I, I don't want the clinical laboratories to just be labeled as this place that's technical and goes off and doesn't know anything about medicine, because that's not the way pathologists work. So just, I'm, I had reached my point of not being able to keep quiet anymore. Oh, no, 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 you, you may. And from the MedSeq study uh, was that the availability of a genome completely changed the patient's engagement mm -hmm. in their clinical care, even if they were in, they were in the well cohort, the healthy cohort. Uh, and so I do think that, uh, again, to echo what Deborah said, that having the patients involved in this is actually going to be a, a vital part of, of moving forward. And then the one other thing I was going to do is to say that uh, a lot of what we've talked about today, all the way from the bi-directional interaction right the way through to building the new assays that you might need for proximate assessment of disease is happening in the undiagnosed diseases network. I mean, that is part of the way the network has been set up. Yeah, two things uh, uh, to build on uh, Deborah's comment. One is, is that in the formative work prior to initiating sequencing component of uh, the MyCode Community Health Initiative, uh, we did focus groups with, you know, um, over 100 uh, Geisinger patients, and uh, almost to an individual, they said, we would like all the data at some point that, you know, and the comments were like, well, we know you guys are busy. We have a lot on your plate. We don't, we're the ones, we're willing to take ownership and help with this because we know you're not going to have the time to do it all. And if you think about that in the context of the discussion we had earlier, which is the updating issue, given the fragmented and disintegrated nature of healthcare in the United States, even if you committed to reanalyzing uh, re someone's sequence, the chances that they're still your patient, um, you know, at a system other than Geisinger is unlikely, and so how do you track them down? How do you get the information? The only constant actor in the healthcare system is the patient, and so in some sense, if that individual has some ownership of that and has tools that would allow them to go in and, and uh, re-annotate and re-update and then use that as the engagement point for the system, I think that's a very innovative uh, approach to uh, think about the problem of this uh, updating information over time. Which is an interesting thought, Mark, for you had mentioned when I first mentioned patients, Genome Connect. But Genome Connect is a unidirectional, you put in your phenotype, you put in your sequence. But what if that could become bidirectional? Um, that would be amazing. Well, and I think um, 
uh, as part of ClimGen, as part of the resources that we're building, I think one of the things that was not, and Erin can certainly, uh, as Queen, speak to this, um, one of the things that we didn't necessarily appreciate at the beginning of the project was the idea that there would be different users of that resource. It was initially built as a clinical genomic resource, but relatively early on as we engaged with patients from the perspective of getting their data, they're saying, well, what could we take from this resource? And now there's a very active group that's looking specifically at how do we build patient specific resources into ClinGen in addition to the laboratory and the clinician and the researcher use groups. So I th and I, I anticipate that that will only increase over time. The, what the last word? Yeah, um, uh, although I'm not a fan of the patient actually physically having the data, having practiced general pediatrics for two years, I know what the reliability is of a patient actually showing up with their vaccination record for their kid, <laughs> and it approaches zero. Uh, so I think having it be somewhere and controlled by the patient is a great thing, um, but not actually physically, physically having it. Um, and I would agree with part of what Deborah said about the important role of the interaction of the treating and diagnosing clinician with the pathologist. And I'm sure, Terry, when you were down in radiology, you were, th that was a bi-directional conversation. You were adding clinical facts to that determination, which then changed the radiologist's perception of and what they were even looking at, uh, which is, needs to happen with us. But I do think it is essential that we keep uh, clear and distinct the, the role of the laboratory in interpreting the pathogenicity of the variant based on what's known about the variant from the role of the interpreting and diagnosing clinician whose job it is to decide that the variant with a given level of pathogenicity is or is not the diagnosis for their patient. And those are two different activities, and it's important to keep the information separate and distinct because the way we're currently doing it is very muddled because there's some phenotypic input on the front end which affects w what parts of the exome and genome are analyzed and then that leads to a constraint of the testing and interpretation and then the clinician says, oh gosh, the patient actually has these six phenotypic criteria. That means you must be right and all that is is reinforcing an error that was made early in the process. So I do think we need to not pretend that the labs are diagnosing the patients. The labs are interpreting the variants, the physicians are diagnosing the patients. And on that note, I'm sorry it is 6.02, but we did reasonably well. Uh, we'll start uh, again tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m., Howard McLeod in the chair. Thank you all very much.